Good morning, everyone. Um, as one of the things that I do to entertain myself and to also, I hope, pass along to others some of what I have learned from Swami Kriyananda, I have been answering questions that people send to me, written questions. I'm going to start doing it also as a, as a video, people sending questions, and I'll just answer them on a camera for the YouTube. <laughs> Every time I say that word, I laugh. But anyway, the YouTube. You hear Swami Kriyananda say it now. He talks about what's on the YouTube. Words have vibrations, and we don't really realize when we say them really what we're saying. When you hear Swami Kriyananda use a word that doesn't have a dignified vibration, you suddenly realize how funny it is, because his entire vibration is so dignified that when funny words come out of his mouth, once he was jockey, joking about, the two, uh, one of the modern phrases he really likes is, been there, done that. And every so often he'll say it. And once he referred to something as, and he just sort of, it was a long momentous pause, and then he called it the pits, like that. <laughs> it was just this sort of realization how much everything we do not only communicates in one way or another, but also communicates with a certain feeling. That's why the common sort of absolute death of poetic language and the ascendancy of uh, uh, crude language is really so much more detrimental than people have any idea that it is. Because it's always just bringing into conversation just sort of uh, deeply physical realities. As, uh, just like we, we all have many dimensions. As Yogananda said, when you go into a beautiful building, he said, every building has a sewer system. But as a rule, you don't say, oh, look, here's this beautiful auditorium. Let me show you the sewers. You know, that we all know that they're, they're there somewhere, but we can choose in life where we're going to put our attention. And what our reading about today is so simple and so profound and so easy to overlook. And this is why uh, it says that when Yogananda was alive and he was teaching to his disciples, he would always talk to them not merely about these deep philosophical principles and Patanjali's eightfold path and as Krishna said in the Gita and he was perfectly capable of talking in the most subtle ways about the most subtle ideas but what he always emphasized for its sheer practical benefit is this question of attunement and the fundamental premise of attunement is a very simple one and this is right out of Autobiography of a Yogi in Autobiography of Yogi, there's a one phrase that says, thoughts are not individual, they are universal. We do not create our life experience, we simply decide what aspect of reality we are going to tune into, and then we become a window for that to come through. It's, it's, a, it's fascinating to meditate on and never ending in its implications. And in fact, every aspect of the spiritual path comes down to a matter of attunement. The pranayamas that you do, the energization, the kriya yoga practices, the meditation, the chanting prayer, everything. It's all for us to be able to use our willpower and our concentration to find among the many, many varied alternatives that literally have an infinite dimension of from the most depraved to the most elevated, it's all happening simultaneously. I've uh, read some books recently based on the experiences people have had in the Second World War. There's a popular book about a man who was a prisoner of war in Japanese concentration camps. And um, that was not the shining hour for the Japanese people. And their behavior toward the cap uh, people they captured from America and from the Allied countries um, was disgraceful. There's no other word for it. Um, more recently, in countries like Rwanda, where prejudices have just been going on forever, people do very unpleasant things to each other. We have it happening right now. And then this last weekend, I was at Ananda Village. I heard Swami Kriyananda speak. And Swami is talking to us about his in this moment perception of the divine bliss 
everywhere he looks, and he, he can't even go on speaking, he says, because he's just so filled with bliss, he can't put words on it anymore. And right on this planet, both of these realities exist. And even more profoundly than that, right within our own hearts, both of these realities exist. Certainly, we would not like to think ourselves capable of profound inhumanity one to another, but nonetheless, the meannesses of the heart are there. And pushed hard enough, who, might, who knows? I don't want to make us nervous in that sense, but these realities are potentials, they're universal potentials. And it might not express as sadism, but it can express as disappointment, it can express as anger, resentment toward others, betrayal, all sorts of things. We know it's there. But the most interesting thing to really contemplate, and Master emphasizes this, he said the only difference between the worst, um, uh, most, the, mo the person who sins the most greatly on this planet and the most saintly person is the way they behave. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting thought to contemplate because nobody is created differently from anyone else. Nobody has any more or less potential for either depravity or for saintliness. The only difference is how we choose to use our energy, what we choose to tune into, and that entirely determines who we want to be. And the other part of attunement, which is why Master put such an emphasis on it, is to get us completely out of what is the most fundamental misunderstanding, in fact, the cause of everything, which is this mistaken perception that, in fact, we are individual. That we stand uniquely, are uniquely responsible for our own reality, and that everything we say just comes from me. This is where Master's single phrase, our thoughts are not created from our own self. They simply exist as possibilities in the universe, and we attune ourselves and become an instrument for it. Swamiji said uh, recently in a talk that he gave, he made this little phrase which was so perfect. He said, it's the ego self which causes us so much suffering. And I don't mean egotism in that way. Ego in this sense means the, the deep conviction we have that we are identified with this physical body, therefore we are separate from the universe, therefore we are vulnerable. It's that idea which causes us to be insecure, to be angry, to feel we have to strike back, to feel lonely, all of these things. It's the ego that causes us to suffer, and then it's the ego that says, oh, I'm suffering. And it just plays on itself over and over again. And the spiritual path is not, as I thought for many years of my life, sort of getting that ego all polished up. That's what we start doing. We start thinking about this quality and changing that quality and worrying about our spiritual progress and feeling depressed because we can't meditate and just all of these different ways that really, in the end, just make even a bigger deal out of this separate self. Either because, well, it's finally getting its act together or, well, it's never really getting its act together. In fact, self-realization is the simple forgetfulness of this, that this one is even there. Because we begin to take the individual and we attune it to the universal. And then when we can attune it to the universal, to the uplifted dimension of the universal, then all of a sudden we simply live in that vibration of consciousness. We are nothing but a vibration of consciousness. Whenever you begin to have any distress about anything, anxieties, a sense of sadness about yourself, you know, the first premise to feeling bad is that you ask yourself, how do I feel? Now, I'm not talking about unhealthy suppression, the inability to have self-respect. This is predicated upon a certain mental health. But once we have a certain mental health, um, and it's necessary to get to that point, because sometimes people try to come on the spiritual path and they hope that they're never going to have to develop mental health. No, it doesn't work that way. But let's assume we have mental health. After we have mental health, then we ask ourselves over and over, what about me? What about me? How are people thinking about me? How do I fit into this? Am I doing the right thing? And that itself 
is a vibration of consciousness. And as long as we keep asking the question, the answer will vary. My reflection back on my whole life, really, from the beginning, I, I didn't have the words for it until I became sophisticated in the teachings of self-realization. But I had the feeling of it, which I can now articulate, and it was simply this. I felt so confined. I just felt confined. I was one little girl living in one little place, living with this one little family, and they could tell me that I could, oh, I could get to be like a grown person. And then I could be one grown person in one place, doing one little thing, choosing one profession, one university. And so I had in my mind that I would multiply myself by having children, because that's a thing that a woman can do, at least in theory. So then I wouldn't be just one. I would be two or three or four or five or six or seven. But when I began to visualize that, somehow intuitively I began to think, that wasn't really very many. And it didn't really solve the fundamental problem, which is just being trapped in this self-consciousness. Swami Kriyananda, sometimes speaking of the Christian idea of heaven, he says, where you go to this, this place, this beautiful place, in a body very much like this one, and you sit around there and you sing hymns for eternity, he said, that to my mind is the definition of hell, is how he put it. Not because of the hymns, necessarily, but because of the continuation of having your consciousness just be defined by this one sense of self. Now, when I first went to Ananda Village in 1971, I ended up very quickly being responsible for what was then the community kitchen. It was at the seclusion retreat but we had about 40 of us, 30 or 40 of us lived up there. We all just lived in extremely primitive uh, cabins and huts and sheds and old bread trucks and school buses. And nobody had kitchens or the capacity to go buy food or anything like that. So we all ate together in this one kitchen. And I ended up being responsible for that kitchen. And I cooked three meals a day, uh, six days a week, with one semi-competent assistant, and I was no hot stuff myself. And on the seventh day, I took, drove the truck into town and filled it up with supplies to come back and cook. Suffice to say, I was busy. I was real busy. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, all I was ever thinking about was food and dishes and shopping and vegetables and so on like that. And it was the first time in my life I had ever um, had something to do that I really, really wanted to do. That wasn't just a question of, oh, I need to go to work, I have a paycheck. You know, I did a few things in school, but nothing that ever took 100% of my energy was, to, from my point of view, morally clean. You know, that it, was, it had absolute integrity to feed these people. And it took 100% of the energy I had. And I experienced for the first time self-forgetfulness. I didn't even know there was such a concept. I didn't know it was possible to become so interested in having something flow through you that there was nobody thinking about the person through whom it was flowing. And I remember when someone actually came up to me and said, how are you? And it startled me to have their energy directed at me and then for me to have to stop and think. And it was a very, I mean, I was very happy when I realized what had happened, and it was sort of a joke. It became a joke for me. I, all I would say in my brief, hurried morning meditations before I'd rush off to cook breakfast, I would just say, Lord, be in the oatmeal, please, because the oatmeal is all I'm thinking about. But I began to understand that I was attuned to a flow of energy, and that flow of energy was a giving energy. And everything that I had spent in my life up until then trying to make myself happy, it was no effort anymore. I was thinking of a larger reality. I was acting in that larger reality. I was giving to that larger reality. I began to understand, ah, in the simplest possible way, this is attunement. And this is why 
we talk about service. This is why we talk about devotion. This is why we, uh, on the spiritual path, um, somebody was saying to Swami Kriyananda not too long ago, a person um, around my age was talking to Swamiji about wanting to live a more inward life. And Swami said, yes, I can imagine a time when there will be an alternative within the Ananda community that you can be a genuine contemplative. You know, in all religious orders, there is that, that idea where you really, you don't need to do any more outward work. You have, where you can really just live primarily in meditation, primarily in solitude. But he said, until that time really comes to us, he said, you must serve and serve and serve intensely. And I remember in another context, this woman was in the very early years of Ananda. Swami had her working seven days a week. And someone, just sort of the way people think, said, she should have a day off. Tell her to take a day off. And Swamiji looked at the one making the suggestion, I know what is best for her. He said just like this. And I reflected on it a little bit. She couldn't use her time well. As soon as she wasn't attuned to giving, as soon as she wasn't attuned to having the right energy flow through her, it wasn't that she went then into a higher state of bliss. She immediately started asking the question, how do I feel? And because of the karmic habit of being attuned, not to the highest level, but to the level that was always, what about me? What about me? Maybe do people really like me? Maybe I'm not really good at this. I didn't really like the way that person was treating me. Whom? That's where you're attuned to. It's like geologic layers. And we have these different karmic layers within our consciousness. And there's a certain um, center of gravity. And if we don't actively attune ourselves to where we're trying to go, then we'll just sink back down into where we've been. And if that was not bliss, don't go there. You know, I remember a woman, this was so ironic. She had the good karma to come to Ananda. She had the good karma to, to find Swami Kriyananda very re responsive to her sincerity. And she started you know, being part of satsangs with him and so on. And then she stopped showing up. Why are you not coming? Someone asked her. Oh, she said, when I spend too much time with Swami Kriyananda, I can't remember my problems anymore. And I'm afraid if I don't concentrate on them, I'll never be able to solve them. Now, if you're not mentally healthy and you're trying to escape from a realistic appraisal of yourself, that could be valid, but it was not valid in her case. It was simply that we start being attuned to something lighter and freer, and you would think we automatically would want it. But that's the comfort, the comfort of the known. You know, I'm used to this. And the other side of it is, sometimes when our energy begins to flow, what we're being asked to tune to is freer and lighter and happier and more dynamic and brings with it greater potential. We just want to go back. You know, the nostalgia for the mud, that's the French expression of it. One friend and I spent a summer afternoon at the river um, playing... Uh, up from the muck, is what we called it. We were on a slippery rock at the Yuba River, and we kept climbing out to higher consciousness, but every time we'd get a little bit of higher, we'd feel this draw to just sink back down again. We acted it out sort of all, you know, for just playing like children for quite some time. But that's what happens. We begin to get free. We begin to discover that I can actually become somebody completely unrecognizable. Because the only difference between me and Jesus Christ is the way I behave. But there, there's this other side. But Master just says very simply, choose what you're going to be attuned to. Choose the light. I am the source of everything, the Bhagavad Gita says. The divine is the source of everything. It's Swamiji looks at us now after all these years. He used to teach very differently. He used to teach very earnestly. He used to teach with lots of intellectual concepts. And there were wonderful classes. Fortunately, we have 50 years of his teaching. You can hear these classes where he goes in such detail with such fabulous intelligence over so many ideas. Now he talks for a while and then he can't talk because he's crying, because he's just feeling the joy. And then he tells us again that we are one with the infinite spirit, and we just need to love everyone. 
I mean, both sides are true. But in the end, from joy I came, for joy I live, in that sacred joy I melt again. The path is not easy. We entertain ourselves with all the interesting complexities of it. But when we finally come back to it, as Master told us, it's very, very, very simple. The divine is there. Where do we put our consciousness? What do we want to channel? Who do we want to be? It's always in our hands at every moment. And the more we reach toward that light, the more the light simply flows through. God bless you.